You have it. Thank you. Thank you. So, I love this guy. This is the late Italian author Italo Calvino, whose birthday it happens to be today, coincidentally. Um, and I think my favorite book of his is one called Invisible Cities. And it's about Marco Polo sitting around in the exotic court of Kublai Khan talking about all the fabulous cities he's been to, places like Olivia, where the peacocks and the fountains just make the people there think about the stink of the tanneries and all the awful things, or Tekla, where there seem to be no blueprints for any of the buildings, but at night, if you go there, the architects will point to the stars and say, there is the blueprint. Marco Polo describes dozens of these, like the, the city that really only exists in old postcards or has a beautiful comet of garbage trailing behind it. And then he finally admits that they all have really just been descriptions of one city, his home city, of Venice. And then Calvino kind of pulls a trick on you. He does a little reverse magic. If you live in a city, if there's a place that you love that's a city, all these descriptions of Venice start to sound familiar. And you realize that, in fact, Venice stands for all cities, including our city of Chicago, where for 180 years or so, we have all been pointing at the stars. Um, now, my book, The Third Coast, kind of put me into Marco Polo's position um, of the books of cultural history of Chicago between the late 30s and 1960, I would say, which meant for me dipping in and out of a lot of different people and times and places within that period. So Mies van der Rohe at IIT, Gwendolyn Brooks on the south side with the Chicago Black Renaissance, Nelson Algren up on the north side in the Polish ghetto. And I didn't want to just do a chapter on each one of these things and sort of turn the page. I wanted the book to exist in time. I wanted to kind of recreate that very messy experience of living through history. So that meant figuring out when I had, could, had to dive in and how long I had to stay there. And when I had to come out and look at Chicago and write about Chicago as one place, as an idea that everyone sort of felt the same about. Now, this is a very hard thing to do. Um, getting that one singular Chicago in mind. And I think that the flag of the Chicago tries to represent that for us a little bit, the three blue, the three uh, white sections, the north side, south side, west side. The blue lines are the lake and the river, and then the four stars of history, or such as they were judged in 1917 when they adopted the flag. Uh, Fort Dearborn, the fire, and then later the ex uh, Columbian Exhibition, and then the Century of Progress Exhibition. Now, without question, I think we can all agree this is the best looking city flag in the world, right? Especially compared to kind of drab New York flag, right? Kind of Dutch inflected thing. And this very peppy Los Angeles Southwestern thing, right? But looks aside, there's a problem with the Chicago flag, I think. If you look closely on the New York and the LA flags, they are open-ended propositions. They both have on there the date the city was founded, and then that's it. Everything that happens after that kind of belongs to what happened. Our flag, on the other hand, basically announces that our history ended in 1934. Now, I think we know that that is not true, of course, but um, you know, to, to have a flag that puts four spots on it to represent our history, and to have the most recent one of those be from here 80 years ago, this is the last thing that the Chicago flag celebrates. So if we were to have a competition, to add or replace some of the stars on our flag, what would we have up there? We might have the Haymarket riot or splitting the atom. I think there'd probably be some votes for the 85 bears. I would probably go there. Um, but the one thing we know we could count on is that there would be a heck of an argument about it. Um, because as much as Chicagoans are absolutely passionate about history and the history of Chicago, they are mostly passionate about their history of Chicago. Even events that have touched the entire city can be very divisive within the city. I think if you were a cop in 1968, you would probably tell a different story about the convention that somebody got pushed through a window on Michigan Avenue. And the election of Mayor Washington was celebrated differently in different parts of the city. So where do we begin looking for a kind of deeper history of Chicago? One that's more than just a sum of all of our kind of tribal memories. 
Now, when we tell the history of our hometown in a very basic way, we're telling the story of how we became who we are. So what are we? I think if, if all Chicago kind of shares an image of itself, right now it's still the city of the big shoulders. No BS, blue collar, smash mouth defense, sorry, but you know, uh, kind of place. And even though those factories and stockyards that our parents and our grandparents worked at are mostly gone, even though that corner bar is just as likely, maybe more likely to give you small plates of molecular cuisine than a small glass of Stroh's, right? The big shoulders in Chicago mostly come from CrossFit, I think, and not so much making tools and stacking wheat. So when we look around the country, we see LA, city of entertainment, Washington, DC, government, uh, Houston, Dallas, energy, Seattle, high tech, New York is New York, right? But here in Chicago, there seems like there's a gap sometimes between our image of the city and what the reality is it, you know, of it right now in the streets. There are some nine million people in Chicago land. By some indexes, it's the sixth most powerful city in the world. But if we ask ourselves, what Chicago is the capital of? Why Chicago? Um, could you really say? Now, during the years I cover in the Third Coast, Chicago knew. Between the late 30s and 1960, Chicago became the nation's prime laboratory, its warehouse, its factory, um, its marketplace. It embraced industry and agriculture. It was where America met itself. It was the original Las Vegas. And whether you came here to see strippers or nominate a president or change trains back home or come up to sing the blues, Chicago in those years, I think, basically invented the American century. Mies van der Rohe uh, makes glass and steel architecture the norm for the American skyline. Ray Kroc gives us fast food nation when he franchises McDonald's. Hef up there hypersexualizes America and the world with Playboy. Um, Mahalia Jackson and Reverend Thomas Dorsey give us gospel. Leonard Chess up on the right. Chess Brothers, do I need to say anything about that? Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Second City and Compass really reinvigorate, transform comedy in America. And this is all during the same period. Then you have Dave Garraway, Studs, Burt Hillstrom, learn to make television a way nobody ever had before. And I'm just scratching the surface. There's a lot more in the book. Um, but once you start talking about the 100 years before that period, and what's happened since then, well, you get this. Which is gonna happen. There it is. This is my entirely unofficial, but hopefully comprehensive list of everything I could find that was invented or launched in Chicago. This is what America has given the world. Now, I'm sure it is incomplete in some places. I know positively that it overreaches in others, but let's just wallow in this for a minute, okay? The yellow pages, the remote control brownies, Roller skates, road maps, ladies and gentlemen, sliced bacon from Chicago, right? This is a remarkable collection, and I dare any other city in the world to beat it. At various points in its life, Chicago has been the home of electronics, of railroads, of air travel, of lumber, of steel, the movie business, advertising, commodities, toy making, candy. This goes on and on and on. So let's enjoy this. Because the main reason I have this up here is in hopes that we can get this kind of thing out of our system once and for all. Like I said, Chicagoans have an incredibly kind of porous wall between their personal histories and the history of the city, a kind of identification with Chicago that, frankly, people who aren't from here can find a little puzzling. And when the world looks at Chicago with anything other than complete love, we get defensive. And then we start shouting out superlatives as if they tell the story. But the fact is superlatives aren't history. First, largest, highest, most corrupt. They don't really tell the story of Chicago, not really. This list here is, I think, a resume without a cover letter. It is a bunch of dots without the lines that connect them. It doesn't describe the qualities that made them possible. It doesn't get to the root of what this city is about. I don't think it tells us why Chicago. Now, when I began researching Chicago at mid-century, my goal wasn't really to write a history. 
what I wanted to get to was the core of what made Chicago different. Why had the city produced so much that was so unlike any other part of the country, and then been able to turn around and mass market them? And as I read and listened and watched, what became clear to me was that what made Chicago great, what made it really special, wasn't so much the quantity of its muscles, but the quality of its minds. And there are to me two constants in Chicago history that together today make the case for why Chicago. For 180 years, Chicago has been America's capital of two things, innovation and pragmatism. The city's true history has always been the story of the new. And this list crawling past you with library paste and nuclear reactors and yellow cabs and poetry slams is proof of that. Other cities innovate, other cities have inventions. That is very true, that's what cities do, it's how they work. But not like this. I mean, we're not talking about arcane patents that fatten people's legal fees and stuff. These are the bones and the muscles of American daily life, and they were created here. Architecture critic Rainer Banham once said, Chicago has no tradition but modern. The most important point, though, isn't that they all happened here. The point is that people came here to make them happen. Now, that might sound like a very fine difference, but it's the difference between coincidence and culture. So why did these people come here? First, because people here like to work. They understand that work gives meaning to their lives. Studs Terkel understood that. Laszlo Moholy Naj, founder of the new Bauhaus and the Institute of Design, understood that that was true even when it came to art. Every day he would get on the bus with a painting under one arm and a lunchbox in the other when he got on the bus. Humans in general, Chicagoans in particular, like to make things. And when the factories closed, Chicago felt that absence to the core. Not only do the Chicagoans like to work, but they also like to watch other people work. When I was a kid, we toured factories for fun. Remarkably enough, I've been to the water filtration plant three times, which is maybe says something about my parenting of my, but Chicagoans enjoy improvisation, they enjoy process. And because that failure in Chicago has never meant what failure in New York means, it's not a final verdict. Chicagoans haven't just enjoyed improvisation, they use it. And the kind of messing around, free play attitude that made Chicago the original Las Vegas also informed John Dewey in the philosophy department at the University of Chicago. It was on the stage of the Grand Terrace when Louis Armstrong first improvised with his horn. It was in the TV studios with Dave Garraway and Captain Bill Eddy when they created the new grammar of television by playing with the technology. Whether we're talking about Second City or Afro Sheen, created in the backyard back of a barbershop at 63rd and Cottage Grove, or Martin Cooper's first portable phone you saw up there, which was based on Captain Kirk's tricorder from Star Trek. Um, they were all the products of play as much as work, but a kind of constructive, aware play of people trying to solve the puzzles of daily life. Work and play together forming process, understanding pragmatism, not like compromise theories, but as creativity being harnessed to function. That is Chicago's entrepreneurial spirit. And it's belonged to everyone here. Everyone has come here for a new start, whether it was from Poland or Wall Street or the Mississippi Delta. Chicago's workers have been as innovative as its businessmen. There were people who left the South or Europe behind to start new lives, and they created a new relationship with government and corporations for labor. Uh, the practicalities and direction of daily life have been both the business and the running debate of Chicago. The details of each of our own personal histories will continue to separate Chicago. Our tribes are very strong here. But what unites us is the spirit of innovation and pragmatism. From Daniel Hale Williams at Provident Hospital doing the first open heart surgery, to Jane Byrne, the first and still only female mayor of a major American city, um, this tradition continues. Roger Ebert and Siskel turned film criticism into something for every man. Steppenwolf Theater reinterprets theater. Doug Sohn over on Roscoe has taken the hot dog and turned it into high cuisine, right? The first African-American president is not coincidentally from Chicago. So whatever happens going forward, and this fabulous panel is gonna talk more about that, I think Chicago really needs to reclaim its role as the city that makes the future. 
The city where John Dewey pioneered progressive education has to look for new solutions to provide education. The city that invented walkie-talkies, police radios, and fire snorkels has to be imaginative in how it serves and protects. The city that produced Jane Addams and Hull House, Saul Alinsky, and community organizing has to attack poverty in the same spirit of the new. Now, there is a genius, I have to say, to the Chicago flag. One that the creators, surely William Hale Thompson, Big Bill, wasn't thinking about. It's the most flexible flag in the world. In the last few years, I've seen a lot more of these kind of things. It's become, I think, Chicago's version of, you know, I heart New York, right? Um, Chicagoans are trading in the fair and, uh, you know, the fires for Polish eagles and campings and, you know, sliced bacon. But what that means is that they're turning history into a framework for invention and for expression, and they're turning it into something that we can all build a new Chicago with together. Now, back in Italo Calvino's Tecla, they might have been content to point at the stars, but here in Chicago, we have to dream of changing them. That is the true Chicago way. You take delight, Calvino has Marco Polo say to the Kublai Khan, you take delight not in a city seven or 70 wonders, but in the answer it gives to a question of yours. May Chicago always be, as it always has been, the place where people come to find the answers to their questions. Thanks.